Hello, my name is Paul Green from the University of Michigan. I'd like to talk about uh, several ISO standards having to do with human-computer interaction and usability. Um, these uh, standards are all part of ISO 9241, which is a single standard. Now, as context, I need to tell you how to find this kind of inf information. I've done that in a number of previous videos, but let me sort of repeat it, but in a more succinct manner. So the first thing one does is one goes to the ISO website, iso.org, then selects taking part, then selects who develops standards, and then technical committees. And then you have to scroll down to find ISO Technical Committee 159, which is ergonomics, then select work program, which is under the quick links um, section, and then scroll down to the appropriate technical committee, either subcommittee one or most of the activities for this particular uh, topic have to do with subcommittee four, ergonomics of human system interaction. Uh, you might be able to get there by Googling directly, but it's not 100% certain which entry on the Google page it will be. The alternative is to literally type in the committee number. So the direct link is iso.org slash committee slash 53372 slash x slash catalog, with catalog being the British spelling, and it will get you there. So what I'd like to do is to talk about a number of fundamental of ISO standards and technical reports related to the design of devices, equipment, facilities, and so forth for human use. That's the focus of this series. Now, other names for this topic are human factors, human factors engineering, usability with various words attached to it, uh, and so forth. And the documents I'm going to talk about is, is just sort of a brief introduction to what's out there. There are many, many documents beyond those that I've listed here. So again, the material on this topic is covered primarily in ISO 9241, which is managed by Technical Committee 159, which is why I previously gave you the directions how to get there um, as context. Now, when this document was first developed, 9241, it was called Ergonomic Requirements for Office Work with Visual Display Terminals. It's actually expanded well beyond that. Furthermore, I should comment that I'm talking about ISO 9241. And the format for the document is really 9241-X, where X indicates a particular section. Um, and in some sense, these are independent standards. Here's an example of the first parts. So for the first few parts, there's a general introduction, guidance, information on keyboards, visual displays, workstation layout, work environment, and other topics. And what I've identified here in bold are the versions that are current, as, as best I understand it, to be current. These have been replaced by other sections, as I'll describe in a moment. Here are some other sections to that document. There's guidance on usability, menus, command dialogues, direct manipulation dialogues, form filling, and so forth. And these are sort of the initial main parts. When this was originally designed as being for office work only and for visual display terminals only. And in fact, the scope has expanded considerably, which is why they've had to basically renumber the document. And so now the document is uh, divided into these uh, 100 series level documents. So the first is all the 100 series. So these, these are concerned with software ergonomics. So the original two digit documents still exist, but they're re being replaced by documents in this 100 or 200 series level, which actually turn out to often be multiple documents. So human system interaction is the one of great interest to us. Displays is of interest. Physical input devices. Workplace, industrial engineers are interested in that. Environmental ergonomics is of interest. And then there are a number of specialized documents. And one of kind of growing and continuing interest is that of taptic, haptic and tactile interactions, uh, which is a series of standards that most people don't know very much about at all. So currently, there are about 30 parts to this document, ISO 9241, and the number keeps going up. So let me kind of walk through quickly some of the documents that are in the hundreds series. 
So here's all the 100 series documents that I know of right now. I should comment that this sequence of documents is continuing to grow, and over time there will be more and more. So there's an introduction, dialogue principles, principles for information presentation. Uh, many of these, as you can see, are, are on fairly narrow topics. There's a whole standard on forms, on guidance for using the web, on voice response, and so forth. Then there's also a 200 series, and I'm going to talk about 210 in detail, which is kind of a framework for interactive system design, part 210. So if you wanted to identify this completely, you would talk about 9241-210. Then here's the 300 series, and these are having to do primarily with visual displays. Uh, I've highlighted three documents because I see with, I believe within these series, these are the most important. So there's a terminology document, there's some design requirements, and then there's test methods. Uh, then there are other documents in this series which are um, noteworthy, but often focused on a very specific or very limited topic. For example, 309 is uh, OLED displays, which is a very particular technology. And you can see here's another one that's rather specific. Um, requirements for photosensitive, reducing photosensitive uh, seizures. Again, it doesn't mean that these are unimportant, but just that they're on very focused topics. On this screen, you see the 400 series level documents, 400, 410, and 420. I'm going to talk at length about 420, which is a selection of input devices, but 410 is also very important as well. Um, finally, there are the 900 series, which are, as you can see by their title, haptic and tactile issues, and also gestures. And here's a topic which hasn't received much attention. Uh, it, here's a topic that has not been transferred from the, the standards literature to the research literature. People that do ge research on gestures almost never mention ISO 9241 part 960. All right, so let me talk about the first of these two standards. First, ISO 9241 part 210, whose title is Ergonomics of Human System Interaction, Human-Centered Design for Interactive Systems. Now, this is a document of some size. It was last published or updated in 210. It has 18 references and 32 pages. And to me, these indications are quite important because you want to know when it was last revised. And the number of references and, and the number of pages is generally a good indication of, the, of its content. In particular, sometimes it's quality. Because the general, my experience has been that the documents that are somewhat longer tend to have a little more useful content. The ones that are fairly short are often just either organizational or kind of motherhood statements that um, are difficult to apply. So here's a partial indication of the table of contents of 9241-210. Um, Pretty much every document starts out with some terms and definitions. Uh, this one has the rationale kind of in the middle, which is rather unusual. Often the rationale is part of the front matter. Then there's some principles, there's planning for design, and other topics that are covered, and some appendices, including an overview of the 9241 series that I've already given you. Um, what I want to comment, which is noted down here at the bottom, is that for all of these table of contents in this and other documents, what I've done is I've not included the front matter, the foreword, the introduction, the scope, and uh, so forth, because they're all pretty much always there, and it would just take up screen space, and you wouldn't be able to read the important information. So with that, let's jump into 210. So first of all, 210, like all of these documents, has definitions up front. You saw that in the table of contents that I listed previously. The definitions that are here primarily come from 9241 part 11, and it's not clear whether, you know, what the long-term future of 9241-11 will be, so it's important to uh, report those, de those definitions and have them here. So first of all, two key terms that are used constantly in this literature that you need to know of is the term goal, which is the outcome that's intended, and task. So a task is a goal plus the activities required to achieve it, commonly referred to as the method. Um, in addition, 
uh, as you'll see, the concept of usability refers to three key terms, effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction. And the definitions that ISO provides are listed here. Again, these originally came from 9241-11, but they're brought forward to this particular document, and this may be the final home for them. So, and also you should notice the way that the definitions uh, refer to each other. So accuracy and a completeness with regard to specified goals, and goal was defined. Efficiency, resources expended, and again, with the perspective being goal, which was defined previously. And then finally, satisfaction is freedom from discomfort and positive attitudes towards the use of a product. Um, the final definition that I want to highlight that's in this document is the definition of usability. And so here it's defined as the extent to which a product, a system, product, or service can be used by specified users, and that's important, to achieve specified goals, that's important, with effectiveness, efficiency, and satisfaction, which were defined up here, in a specified context of use. And you'll see the term context of use is important because there are documents that relate to it. So why would you want to do human-centered design? Uh, this question comes up a lot in industrial settings and in government settings. And so the question is, what are the arguments? Um, this is a topic that I cover in the first lecture of the Human Factors Engineering short course. Here's a list that's in ISO 9241-210. I'm not going to say that it's better or worse than other lists, but it is something at least that's useful if you're trying to make the argument. You can say that, well, I drew these arguments from the standard, and then the standard is accepted practice. So to increase efficiency and productivity, and the focus is on making the organization better, to reduce training costs, for training costs to reduce if it's easier to use, to increase accessibility. Accessibility is now a much more important issue than it was 10 or 15 years ago. To improve the user experience. Now the concept of experience is something that was not given much attention in the past and now for lots of services and systems is. To reduce discomfort, competitive advantage. If you can make your system easier to use, then maybe people will buy it instead of a competitive product. And again, sustainability is another topic that has become increasingly important uh, and needs to be given some attention. All right, so in focusing on user-centered design and human-centered human design, the issue is, what are you trying to do? What are the sort of basic principles, ideas, concepts you need to follow? And so I've taken what was in the ISO document and revised it slightly to just have it flow a little better. So if you think about the purpose of human-centered design to be developing something, you want it to be based on the user's tasks and environments. You want to involve users in the process. You want the whole process to really be user-centered. You know, how do we make this thing so the user benefits? And if the user benefits, invariably the system does. Uh, design is iterative. This is different from other aspects of engineering where you just use the waterfall model and things fall in one step after the other. Here, because there are a lot of unknowns, you create something, you try it, you see how users react. Based on their reactions, you make changes, you try it again, you make more changes, and you loop through this process a number of times until you get something that's really good. This is not reflecting a lack of qualifications of the people involved. It's just that the, there are a lot of unknowns and the only way you often identify how to solve those un unknowns is by having people try it. So the process needs to be iterative. Um, you want to address the whole user experience. So if you're designing a car, you want to not only understand how they drive it, but the problems in purchasing it, getting it serviced, getting in and out, the entire user experience. And then finally, what's important is that to really do a good system that's to be used by people, you need a wide variety of expertise. You know, you need people who have knowledge of human behavior, human performance, system design, and the technical aspects of the system. And all of them need to work together to build a successful and easy to use interface, a system that's human centered. All right, so let me focus on uh, one particular document, which has a lot of details in it. And that's ISO 9241 Part 420, 
which has to do with the selection of physical input devices. So this document was last updated in 2011, it has nine references and 106 pages. And this, I think, is an important clue, that a document that has 106 pages, you would think should have a tremendous amount of content that's useful, and this one does. So here's a truncated version of the table of contents. Um, and as usual, it talks out, ta it starts with terms and definitions. There are general, as an outline of some of the procedures for selecting equipment, since that's what the purpose of this document is. And then there are a number of methods for, uh, at kind of a high level, for selecting uh, devices. But the real value of this document, the real substance of it, is in the appendices, what they call annexes. And these annexes talk about various tests for assessing the usability of various kinds of physical devices. And what I'm going to be doing in the rest of the presentation is talking about some of those tests in great detail. So these tracing, dragging is used for primarily pointing devices. Assessment of comfort is general. Tapping is for pointing devices of particular types. Mobile data entry is for keyboards. There's also a second piece for keyboards. And finally, in there is, are tables that can be used to help you select devices. Uh, these tables are extremely useful. I'll provide a few examples. So with that, before I get on to the specifics, let me talk about definitions. So again, these are terms that appear in uh, ISO 400, which is the overview document for physical devices for the 400 series. So there's a definition of what dragging is and what pointing is. Uh, we all have a sense of what they are, but if we're going to do tests, we really need a formal definition of what these particular tasks are. Uh, in addition, there's uh, some definitions for a number of device names and what they are. Again, people know what they are, but certainly it's helpful when you're talking about a particular device to have a reference that says, here's the formal name for what this device is. Uh, sometimes you get into oddball devices and you're wondering, how do I classify it? The formal definition helps. And finally, because there's a lot of information in this document about keyboards, there are a number of terms related to keyboards and definitions like what is the home row height, what is the slope, what is the rollover, and how these things are measured. These are important physical characteristics. So what's the objective? Why does this document exist? You probably know it. But it doesn't hurt to at least mention some of the examples of why we would worry about um, device evaluation and selection. Um, so what I've done is I've taken their list and revised it slightly. So you might be comparing devices. You might be using a device in a different way or substituting it. You might be wanting to know how to design the device. So you might need minimum characteristics or optimum characteristics. Uh, this device might be fitting in some kind of workplace, so you're designing the workplace and you need information to design it. And finally, for some of these devices, there are settings or control parameters that you need to set to make them operate uh, effectively. And so, for example, for a number of input devices that are used for pointing, there are, there's some filtering sometimes that exists to, remove, to eliminate jitter. So, for, for example, if you watch me move the cursor across the bottom of the screen, it's in a fairly smooth manner. It's not like this, I'm exaggerating, where it jumps from point to point. Somebody's done something to make the operation smooth. So you might want to know how to assess that. All right. Now, uh, lots of devices, physical devices, especially used for computers, are used for pointing. And the performance in pointing tasks is often defined using something called the index of difficulty, which uh, comes from Fitts Law. And they have a somewhat unusual way to specify it, or one that's a little different than what you typically see. So just by way of background, index of difficulty is a measure of the user uh, precision required to perform some task. And it's, me it's measured in bits. And so here's the definition of in ISO, in this particular document, 420, for the index of difficulty. It's, equal, it's a commonly abbreviated as ID, sometimes ID at the same height, sometimes is subscripted, equal to the log of base 2 of D plus W over W. Um, this is distance and width, 
I'll de define them more precisely in a moment. And then for tracing task, which is where you're trying to follow a line, the index of difficulty is D over W. And this is a much less common uh, representation of index of, w, of index of difficulty, and in part because tracing tasks are less common. And so to be more specific, D, which is here, is how far you have to move to the target. So if I'm going from here to here, that's this distance. And W is the target width along the axis. So if I'm going from here to here, and my target is to get on the two, then the boundaries of the two is this width here. So that's Fitt's law. Again, it's really important. And uh, you'll see maybe later on how it's used. So as I mentioned, in this particular document, there are a large number of tables that are quite useful. And here's a table for selection criteria that's focusing on the usability of devices. So down the left-hand side here, you see all the devices that are of interest, keyboards, mice, tablets, joysticks, etc. And then across the top are the characteristics that are of interest, rapid pointing, accurate pointing, selecting, dragging, and so forth. And then there's a uh, scoring system from low to high. And so the number of cells that are darkened indicates the usability of each particular device for each particular purpose. Um, the point, an important point to be made here is there is no best device overall, but rather devices vary in terms of how well they achieve particular tasks. And so this may be very helpful in figuring out for what kind of tasks that a user might be form, performing in some context, which device should be selected for that purpose. Um, now let me talk more specifically about the various procedures that are described in this particular document to assess these input devices. So Annex B talks about a tra tracing task, and this is for freehand input. So here's what the basic task is. There are four circles that a user is given. There are 100 millimeters in diameter, and the user's task is to trace the particular circle and while doing so, the clock is running and performance is recorded. And one does this for all four circles. It's not clear from the document how many times one does this. And here's the scoring procedure. So that circle is divided up into 36 uh, segments. And at each of 36 points, in other words, each 10 degrees, one measures the difference between the target, which is the circle, and the trace formed by where the person traced. And you measure the deviation to the nearest millimeter and the time to the nearest tenth of a second. And use that to assess the quality of performance in using an input device to trace circles. Um, one could use other objects, but the advantage of the circles is it involves motions in all directions. Appendix or Annex C is a dragging task and it involves moving dots to circles, and it looks like this. So there are a series of circles and a series of dots, and the user's task is to take the dot, drag it down to this circle, then go up the next one, drag it down, and repeat the process for downward movements, for upward movements, for movements to the right, and movements to the left. Again, the intent is to try to get movements in all directions overall in selecting a device. Uh, the details are the dots are eight millimeters, the circles in which they fit are 10, and the movement distance is 100 millimeters. And in this particular case, they say repeat it 10 times in each direction. Um, here's the scoring procedure. Um, dots can either be dead on, sort of on, or touching or outside the uh, outside circle. And basically what one does is one measures the location of the dot to the nearest millimeter, scores it in these, one of these three categories as a 3, 2, 1 and then determines the time to the nearest millisecond. Uh, Annex D talks about comfort. There are 12 scales of comfort that are used by this procedure. Um, I'm only showing here three of them. So you require, determine the force required for actuation, and it varies on a scale from one to seven, with one being very uncomfortable, seven being very comfortable, and the user selects the level of comfort. There's also smoothness during operation, and effort required for operation. Uh, the other scales are very similar. 
Um, those other scales are divided basically into two categories. Uh, general, which has to do with the following characteristics, actuation force, smoothness, and effort, which you just saw, and in addition to accuracy, operation speed, general comfort, and overall operation. And in addition, there are a few more, and they're all related to fatigue. And then the question is, what body part is fatigued? Finger, wrist, arm, shoulder, or neck? Um, in addition, there's also a, there's further assessment of fatigue. This is done using the Borg scale. The scale that's in the document is this. Uh, it doesn't say so, but it's the CR10 scale from 1982. And it's used to, uh, to rate various aspects of discomfort. So one identifies the degree of discomfort that one is experiencing and then, and then finds the associated uh, scale value, point value, on the Borg scale to identify the level of comfort or discomfort a person is experiencing. Annex E talks about a one direction tapping test that's sort of the classic fits tapping task. The graphic looks like this. I've redrawn it from the original. And basically, a person taps back and forth between these two targets. And as noted, they want you to tap 25 times. Uh, the movement distance is varied, and the target width is varied across trials. And one measures um, performance in this case. Uh, the movement distance is center to center. The target width is uh, fixed. And the assumption is that about 95 or 96 percent of the taps fall within the width of this object. If not, then adjustments need to be made. Uh, for some reason, they talk about varying levels of index of difficulty from four to six and categorize them as low, medium, or high. It's kind of odd because it's in there, it all makes sense, but they never really, I didn't really see why they made this distinction and saw where in the document it was picked up. It may be somewhere that I didn't see it, or it may be used elsewhere. Um, also, I again want to uh, reiterate the performance measurement is the time to perform this tapping task 25 times in milliseconds, and errors, errors are measured to the nearest millimeter. Uh, another version of the tapping task is in Appendix F. It's the multi-directional task. And across this task, the size of the targets and movement distances are varied. The current version of ISO 94, uh, 9241 doesn't have exactly this graphic. It's slightly different, so you will have to go to the original, to the current version to get it. I want to avoid some copyright problems. But in brief, the task is to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8. That's the task. And again, it's timed. So again, we have a movement distance and a target width, just like in other Fitz law calculations. And the advantage of this is that you need to move in multiple uh, directions. And again, the performance measurement is time in milliseconds and error to the nearest uh, millimeter. Uh, Annex G is used for assessing handheld keyboards. Here's a list of some of the information that you use for that task. And basically, one takes the data uh, and the text and enters it into using this uh, mobile device. This is a, about a third of the entire list. And one simply measures performance. And they decide to get fairly random letters and random number strings and put some breaks in it to aid in uh, performing this task. And again, if you want the full list, you need to go to the original document, 9241-420. Again, my purpose in this presentation and all the others was not to make it so that everything that was in the document was reproduced in the video, because that would create some uh, copyright issues, but rather to give you enough so that you have a sense of what's in there, and then what, with some confidence, can make a decision as to whether the content of these standards is relevant or not relevant to what you do. And again, as with all of these tasks, the method of assessing performance is to record time and errors. I do not believe for this one that they give timing accuracy requirements. Uh, last, I want to mention Appendix H, which has a huge number of tables for device design. And these are extremely complicated. If I tried to show you the entire table, you wouldn't be able to read it. So what I've done for all of these tables is abstract a few examples to give you a sense of their content. So this is a particular table for compact keyboards. And 
it's showing things like key top shape, strike surface, and you can see that there's some fair amount of real specifics here. So for example, it says the strike surface shall be greater than or equal to 110 millimeters squared and so forth. Um, that if you're talking about keyboard force, the force at the snap point should be somewhere between a half newton and eight tenths of a newton. Um, there's also similar information for a full size keyboard. And in addition, there are also other topics that are covered with regards to both compact and full size keyboards, force displacement issues, feedback, legend, slope, surf gloss, uh, surface gloss, the list has about, I don't know, 15 or 20 items. Now here's another example. This one happens to be for joystick. And again, it's just one piece of one table. So there's issues, okay, the, some, of them, some of the comments in there and, and specifications are fairly general, like it just shouldn't move. Um, but then there's specific ones. So in this case, for a finger-operated joystick, you want between 0.05 and 1.1 newtons, which is quite a wide range. And then displacement and how much the joystick should move if it's a displacement, not more than 45 degrees left, right, 30 degrees forward, and 15 degrees aft. Uh, here's one more. Here's touch pads. Again, the same level of detail. So for things like button force, you're getting a required range. Here it's a half newton to 1.5 newtons. Um, there are issues for button travel and so forth. So lots of details in these documents. If you're designing these devices or assessing them, these are the kinds of documents you want to uh, look at. Uh, lastly, I want to mention that there are a wide range of devices beyond these that are included in this document. So there are all sorts of specifications for mice. There's a rather lengthy section on trackballs, styli and light pens, touch screens, pucks, and tablets and overlays. So this is an extensive document. There's a lot of detail. And if you're designing or selecting these kinds of devices, ISO 9241-420 should be something you should really look at very carefully. And in fact, you should have a copy of. So with that, I'm going to take a quick break. And then I'll move on to part two, which has to do with systems and software quality requirements and evaluation, commonly referred to as SQUARE.